Hello, blue. Yeah. The guys, I wore blue for you, you see, right? Blue shirt, blue pants. It's time for this week in microbiology. This is a special episode, number 114. Wow. Today is October 22nd, 2015. Hey, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Today, I'm at Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm at the University of Michigan, and we are celebrating the naming of microbiology and immunology as a historical site by the American Society for Microbiology. This is called Milestones in Microbiology, and the plaque designating this is uh, shown here on my right. It's going to be screwed to a wall somewhere, hopefully not in a bathroom. Right? <laughs> so today, the purpose of this TWIM is to highlight this department, to tell you why it's a milestone site, and look at some of the science as well, all in 10 minutes. <laughs> now, we have more than that. But joining me today, I have an incredible cast here, and I have two of the TWIM regulars from right here in Ann Arbor, Michelle Swanson. Hello, it's just great to have you right here in Ann Arbor. You, right? Thank you. <laughs> it's great to have you here. And from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Uh, hi. How you doing, Elio? It's nice to see you in vivo. In vivo, we are in vivo. Elio and Michelle usually join us via Skype. And Michelle, she always comes right off the golf course, you know, so she's all <laughs> out of breath and late, right? <laughs> I thought we were going to keep that between us. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and we have three guests from uh, the department here. On Elio's left, she is a professor in microbiology and immunology, also associate dean of graduate and postgraduate education, Mary O'Riordan. Delighted to be with you. Welcome to TWIM. And on her left, he is the Frederick Novi Distinguished University Professor and Chair of Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Harry Mobley. Hi, Benson. Welcome. Thanks for Thanks so much. having, and you actually are responsible for having TWIM here, so thank you for inviting us. And finally, all the way on the right, last but not certainly least, he's an associate professor in microbiology and immunology, Vincent Young. Or Vince today, since you're Vincent. You like right? to be Vince. I'll be Vince today. Okay. Could you guys hear him without his mic? No, no. All right, so Vince, Vincent or Vince, whenever you talk, grab the mic. Can you hear me? All right. So what I like to do on TWIM is to find out where people uh, are from and uh, how they were raised and, and brought here. So we'll go through that, and then we'll talk about some other things about the department. And then if we have time, we'll talk about science. I know, I know where you came from, and I know where Alio came from. But Mary, where are you from? And tell us your educational path here to Michigan. Sure. So I hail originally from Seattle, Washington, uh, but my father used to work for the United States government, so I grew up in exotic places overseas, including uh, Indonesia and Egypt and Thailand, and that was a lot of fun. And um, part of that enabled my interest in biology because my, my mother told me when I was 10 years old, I don't remember this, but uh, when she asked me what I wanted from the market, I said, bring me a goat so I can see what's inside of it. And I think that kind of really got me going um, to find out how biological things worked. So I did my undergraduate work at the University of Washington, and I really fell in love with research there, working with Michael Cates, who's a virologist, got to work with influenza and polio and HIV. And that was, I think, really formative for me as a scientist. Um, and I went on to do my PhD work at the University of California, San Francisco, in immunology with Rudolf Groschadel. And then really combining those two um, disciplines, microbiology and immunology, with Dan Portnoy, who uh, is a scientist that many of you know. Uh, and he has done some just tremendous work on both uh, bacteriology using a really well-known system, Listeria monocytogenes, and also um, looking at the interaction of that interesting pathogen with the innate immune system. And I've continued that interest and work in my own lab here at the University of Michigan. How long have you been here in Michigan? 12 and a half years. Yeah, time flies. Huh? When you're having fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you still having fun? Yes. All right. Even more fun than ever. Great. Thank you. Harry, you've been here the longest. Le yeah, 11 right? years. Yeah. 11, 11 years. 11 great years, yeah. Oh, so you haven't been here the last year. No, Mary's no been I, here I, I wanted to claim Harry and Mary, but I was unable to do so. Okay. It was Mike Imperiali. So tell us where you're from. Certainly. I, I hail from uh, another exotic place, South Carolina, <laughs> the large town of Rock Hill. And, uh, but I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. 
Uh, from thence, I went to uh, Emory University, where I, I played soccer, and that, I have to say that was the kind of the center of the universe for me, playing soccer and not microbiology. Uh, I did have an eight o'clock microbiology class, however, with a assistant professor uh, who took us to the CDC, which was on uh, Emory's land at the time. They leased it to the federal government for a dollar per year, so we were actually allowed in back then, way back when. And so we got excited about uh, microbiology, but then I kind of forgot about it for a while and continued to play soccer. I went home and to my home state and played soccer, and while I was playing soccer, I happened to go to graduate school at my local uh, university, University of Louisville, and there I was inspired by uh, Ronald J. Doyle, fantastic uh, microbiologist who really got me uh, fascinated with bacterial physiology. Uh, and then I went on to uh, postdoctoral work in biochemistry at University of Maryland uh, with a fellow named Barry Rosen, who was an outstanding scientist in membrane transport. And then uh, one year with Jim Caper, uh, learning uh, cloning and pasting back when it was kind of a fresh discipline in the uh, Center for Vaccine Development at University of Maryland. Then I opened my own laboratory and was there for 23 years until I moved uh, here. So it's been a fantastic move to Ann Arbor and uh, uh, a great community of scholars. You say you happened to go to graduate school. I happened to go to graduate school. How, how does, did you get injured or I something? I think that's very accurate. Yeah. yeah. You still play soccer? I, I, I don't. I was, uh, I was playing soccer uh, after 40 years of playing, and uh, a young fellow went past me like I had concrete boots on, and I said, that's it. It's over. <laughs> okay. All right. Vincent, where are you from? I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York, another exotic location. Uh, and then I went to, as an undergraduate, I went to MIT. And I've been fortunate throughout my education that all of my mentors have just happened to be microbiologists. At MIT, you have a freshman advisor, and mine happened to be a newly minted assistant professor named Graham Walker. Oh, wow. He had just started at that time, and uh, he had gotten me started in Ethan Signer's lab and then moved me over to Bob Sauer's lab. And so I had the microbiology bug, and then I went to Stanford for my MD-PhD. And I was starting to explore all sorts of things. I thought that you know cell biology, everything else was kind of cool, but then it kind of came back that Lucy Tompkins said, you know, you should talk to my husband, Stan Falco. Uh, he and Gary Schoolnick are looking for a grad student to co-mentor, and an MD-PhD student would be good. And so I managed to get my PhD with the two of them. And then after finishing my clinical training, I went back to MIT for a postdoc with David Schauer. And then my first faculty appointment was at Michigan State University. Apparently, there was a football game last weekend. Sorry. Um, Woo. <laughs> where's Vic? Um, so I was at Michigan State, and one of the reasons I went there is I'd been studying gastrointestinal infectious diseases, and we were always wondering about all the other bugs that we put in besides the pathogen that we would put into there. And David had said, you know, you're looking at MSU, and they have some good microbial ecologists there. I asked to talk with Tom Schmidt. I said, would you be able to kind of train me a little bit in your microbial ecology? That kind of turned into a new area for me. And then in 2007, I came to the University of Michigan and been there, been here for the past eight years. All right. Well, that's a sampling of some of the great faculty here. Now, I want to talk now a little bit about why this is a, a milestone site. Maybe, Harry, you can give us a little background on that. So we're the uh, 11th such site. Uh, and I think the reason we're the 11th such site is we didn't fill out the application earlier. So finally we got uh, uh, Vic Dorita, Kerry Debick, and uh, Jeremiah Johnson on the case, and uh, uh, they, they put out a beautiful application where, uh, in fact, they even found that there was ASM headquarters had been here on Huron Drive, and they had a picture of this kind of crummy little building that they occupied in the 50s, is that right? Yeah, in the 50s. Uh, so I had a little, bit of, a little bit of history there. Obviously, we heard the history this morning, the uh, fantastic uh, founding of the department by a really classic microbiologist who uh, uh, had you know, some training with both uh, Robert Koch and uh, visited Pasteur's lab, brought those te techniques back here, and then uh, was a, was a uh, pioneer in the history. And then we also saw on our plaque uh, quite a few other people uh, that uh, had contributed. You know, uh, 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 Victor Vaughn preceded... Uh, uh, Fred Novi was uh, was big into hygiene. Of course, that's our name for bacteriology before bacteriology. Hygiene. Uh, hygiene. And we had the uh, first building was built in uh, for for hygiene or bacteriology in uh, 1888 at a cost of thirty five thousand dollars. Almost they had one hundred and forty seven dollars that they used for equipment left over from that budget. Uh, and then the course first medical school courses were taught in the United States in, in that building. 
uh, as far as we know, and uh, many other milestones such as that. So then uh, we, you know, we had a long history of uh, excellent scientists. Fred Neidhart was an incredible pioneer in bacterial physiology and maybe invented bacterial proteomics. I think it's fair to say that he had a huge influence uh, there. Paul de Cruyff with his, uh, with his uh, microbe hunters and uh, assisting with Aerosmith, which is not just the band, of course, but it was actually a book. So we want to point that, want to <laughs> verify that. Uh, uh, and then, of course, other individuals associated with the department was, uh, was uh, Thomas Francis, is that right? Who was in the School of Public Health, who pioneered the 1.8 million children uh, polio vaccine, of the Salk vaccine, uh, and the success of that was announced in 1955 in Rackham uh, Auditorium. Now, there are hundreds of faculty since then that have contributed significantly to science, and we, our plaque's not big enough to have them all, but uh, many of our current scientists have made huge impacts in their high-impact journals and, uh, uh, and their work. And if I could add one more thing, not to take the entire time, but uh, the tremendous service of our faculty to the community of microbiology nationwide, and I think we'll probably talk about that a little bit more, but uh, a lot of selfless activities going on in behalf of uh, ASM and other uh, other ventures. So we're extremely proud of this event and really appreciated Pal Kazanjian giving a talk this morning on Frederick Novi and then uh, having one of Novi's descendants here is ex extremely exciting. Heather Smith, is it <laughs> correct? Heather Smith is here. Uh, and what a great, great, great or great, great? Two greats, two great Great, great granddaughter of Frederick Novi uh, is here. So lots of history, We're steeped in history. Are you a microbiologist by any chance? Yes, I am. Wow. <laughs> Where, here? In uh, the Lansing area. Nice, that's great. I'm yeah, happy to hear that, very good. You're taking notes, right? <laughs> so you, so Novi was also the inspiration for the central character in, in Aerosmith, not Aerosmith, right? Aerosmith, correct? Correct, uh, Dr. Max Gottlieb was uh, in large part uh, uh, used to fashion, I mean, uh, Novi was, was in large part used to fashion the character of Max Gottlieb, and other, other factors went into there alone also. And, uh, by, by the way, the theme of the book, hasn't been mentioned, is phase therapy, something that's coming up again. So what, comes, what goes around comes around. It's a great book. I love it. I have to say, my, my mother used to teach it in her English classes in high school, and I have her paper copy with all of her notes in the margin, I go to all the time. It's just fabulous, love it. Um, so uh, Michelle last night gave me a whole list of things to, to have each of you discuss, which <laughs> refer to the strength of the department and why this is uh, important as a, as a site. So Harry, for you, she wanted you to mention the, the institutional culture of collaboration that's, that's present here. Can you talk about that? Okay, well certainly, I mean each department, if you ask them, how their tendrils go across the university, they're all different, but microbiology uh, collaborates with uh, infectious disease heavily. In fact, we have a couple of split primary appointees in infectious disease. Uh, Evan Snitkin right here, Adam Laring also have been very valuable uh, to us. We have several joint appointees that are uh, from infectious disease. We have colleagues in the School of Public Health also, uh, uh, Betsy Foxman, Carl Mars, and, and, and others. And then also on the main campus in literature, science, and the arts, in, uh, a Department of Molecular and Cellular and Developmental Biology, Matt Chapman, and uh, let's hear some other names. Tom uh, Schmidt. Tom, well, of course, Tom Schmidt, Wild, also as a Wild joint Simmons. appointee here. Lyle Simmons, Simmons, who works on uh, recombination repair, and Kim Seed. And Kim, and Kim Seed. <laughs> and then we have uh, our next to last appointee uh, in the department, uh, President Mark Schlissel, the president of the university. So uh, when he came as president, you, you gave him that appointment along with that? Is that how that well, worked? He wanted it. He, he wanted, wanted this it. appointment. Of course, we didn't want him in the department, but no, I'm, we did I'm joking. Vote. We did vote at we faculty did vote, meeting. And by a narrow margin, he was uh, <laughs> accepted unanimously into the department. And uh, I, I was kidding, but he's welcome to come anytime. And in fact, I believe he has a startup package waiting for uh, waiting for uh, whenever that comes. He hasn't come to faculty meetings, though. He has not come to faculty meetings. Very disappointing. <laughs> if I may interject, before this uh, podcast, we had a session here, and the president, President Schlissel, gave a short presentation in which he said golden words. He pointed out that the origin of modern biology, as we know it, of molecular biology, is all microbial. That all the fundamental findings that we treasure and cherish were all done with bacteria and bacteriophages. 
To hear a president of a university recognize such deep truths is indeed heartwarming. Yeah, you, as he said, you probably won't find a university president anywhere that knows what a plaque assay is. <laughs> he actually mentioned those two words, my favorite two words <laughs> in microbiology, plaque assay, and he said it. You know, I have to say, uh, Wednesday night, I went to a talk at our medical school, Columbia, by Lee Bollinger. Guys know him? Yeah, he was your president here. And he would not know what a plaque assay is, but he does know a lot about First Amendment. And that was a great talk as well. So not only am I wearing blue, but you know we have a connection here at Columbia. We have your former president. Mary, um, Michelle said that you would be able to talk about the department's commitment to training. Absolutely. So one of the things that I really appreciate about this department, um, and I'll, I'll phrase that in the context of shared governance. So this, of course, applies at the level of the faculty, but one of the things that I think is really wonderful about our department is it's also shared governance that includes our, our students and our postdocs, and they are really an integral um, uh, part of the life of the department, and they have a very strong student organization. They have a, a really robust um, uh, postdoctoral organization, and in fact, they are leaders in various initiatives across campus as well. And so one of the things that I think is important is not only the fact that we take mentoring and training very seriously, but that we are really um, bringing up along with us uh, generations of, of colleagues that go on to do many exciting and interesting things. So Michelle um, reminded me that there were a number of, I think, really diverse and interesting directions that our trainees have gone. We've had uh, trainees go to the CDC. Um, we have uh, former trainees that are now um, working at NIAID, um, working on science policy. We, of course, have many trainees that have gone on into different academic institutions, um, have started companies, are uh, really doing important work in various aspects of microbiology and companies, including um, sort of agricultural microbiology, medical microbiology, and many others. And so I think we do have a really strong and proud tradition in that area of training. Vince, Michelle said you'd be able to talk about, isn't this great that she, she fed me all this stuff? The institutional commitment to research. So this institutional commitment to research, you know, extends, am I doing a good job, Michelle? I don't wanna, I don't wanna disappoint. Remember, this is all about Michelle here. Um, <laughs> The institutional commitment to research extends you know, across all fields from basic science to clinical research. So my uh, primary appointment is actually in the Division of Internal Medicine, in, uh, sorry, the Division of Infectious Diseases in Internal Medicine. So I'm one of the joint appointees that Harry talked about. And one of the reasons that I came here was the fact that as a physician scientist, I was looking for places where there were clinicians who were interested in important questions, not just patient care, but trying to push the field of medicine forward. And yet they were partnering with the basic scientists and working together to try to come up with tomorrow's sort of cures and preventions. So I think that this can be manifested in something that Harry and I, along with Tom Schmidt, are helping shepherd along here, which is the host microbiome initiative. The uh, dean of the medical school uh, had invested in areas where he thought there can be synergy between basic science and clinical science. And I know on your podcast, you've talked ad nauseum about the microbiome. But there are people here who have been working on what could be called microbiome science long before that term became quite so popular. And in fact, uh, one of them, Gary Huffnagel, was the one who sought me out and wanted to know if I'd be interested in coming back to a tertiary medical center and trying to apply this idea of looking at microbial communities in health and disease. I, I don't see it ad nauseum. I think it's fascinating, and I, I, I would never get sick of it, right? Because we're not even close to understanding it. So, but no, and no one complains except Elio. <laughs> Maybe you could talk up too about the Human Microbiome Initiative. It's right. <laughs> Wasn't that what I was talking about? <laughs> <laughs> talking about the host microbiome. Well, but a number of a uh, number of the investigators here, Patch Loss and others in the uh, audience, were actually a major part of the NIH-funded Human Microbiome Project. And when that was started in 2009, I had actually just gotten here about a year before when Gary had brought me here. And there was a meeting in Bethesda. The NIH called it, said that we're going to start this Human Microbiome Project, and. I basically congratulated the folks here that, boy, you really have positioned yourself to be part 
of this human microbiome project. Uh, we were fortunate enough to compete successfully for one of these so-called demonstration projects that was centered here. It was actually a multi-center kind of project. It involved the University of Chicago, the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, our friends up at Michigan State, and University of Michigan. So even though we can joke about what happens on the football field, you know, we are not very far apart, 50 miles apart. We have now the chairman of the micro department up at MSU is our good friend, Victorita. And I think we've continued this kind of synergy, not just within the institution, but really across the spectrum of microbiology, finding kind of collaboration wherever it can be found naturally. You always wear a bow tie. Folks, do I always wear a bow tie? Yeah, there's a lot of nodding out there. Yeah, I do. But I, I did wear my U of M colors today. There's no green and white yeah, that's anywhere right. here. So. Is it always the same one, or do you have many? <laughs> many. many. Too many. This is according Too to many. Some okay. Say. So, Michelle, you could talk about the department's culture of equity. I can. Um, I think we saw some historical photos of um, the department way back when. It was um, a very distinguished looking group of gentlemen. Um, we're amazed that right now we, as Harry said in his remarks, we have more women faculty directing research programs in our department than men, which I think is, we probably are the only basic science department in the country um, that, that can say that. What do you think? Does, can anybody no, I think that's, dispute I've, that? I've, I've mentioned it at national meetings and no one's disputed it, so that's my, that's my data. <laughs> Those are my data. And so uh, it's, uh, it, it's probably true. And by the way, it's by one. Uh, right. So we're, we're outnumbered by one. Uh, and it's really been, uh, as I said, we always chose the best scientists, and that's how we, how we got there. But, but I'll say to our listeners uh, nationally that it's, um, it takes focused effort. And um, we are fortunate here at the University of Michigan that we're really committed to diversity. And one of the ways um, they have um, addressed that is they acknowledge that professional women typically have a professional partner. So if you're trying to recruit a woman, you often have to recruit an, a second professional. So there is not only a, a dual career office um, that the partner can work with um, a, a, to try to find a position um, in Southeast Michigan, but there's also money at the provost level to um, uh, put toward a second position if the profession if the person the faculty member that we're trying to recruit has a professional partner who could work at the university there is money to put toward um, a position that per perhaps would not have been available otherwise so I think by putting in real uh, measures with teeth we're able to not only um, recruit the, the best women but actually get them to come because they can also make it work for their for their families so I'm really proud of that. You know, it's very interesting having just heard Lee Bollinger talk. And as you know, when he was here, the equal opportunity was a big part of his work. And he, he, part of his talk was that you cannot consciously balance things. You cannot consciously have the same number of women or minorities or anything. You have, if you do that, it's unconstitutional. And you have to have creative ways of doing it. So it's not easy, right? And not creative, but practical, just recognizing. So for example, a study was done where, where we pulled all the male scientists at Michigan and asked, how many of you share your home with a person who works full time? Hmm. They asked the same question of the female scientists. How many of you share your home with a partner who works full time? And what would you guess the distribution was? Any, anybody want to guess? Men versus women? So, so for men, about 25 or 30 percent had a partner who worked full time, and for the women, it was more like 80 percent. So just in general, if you're trying to recruit a, a professional woman, you probably have to recruit a partner as well. All right, then one more area, and this one you also assigned to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you emailed me at, at 11 p.m. This is okay, so I'm doing it. You, good guy. Department culture of citizenship and leadership. This is easy. 
Um, it is easy, and it's it's something that we um, heard about in the wonderful lecture um, about that, that was really a tribute to um, um, Frederick Novi, and that is that many of our faculty not only excel in research, but we're also contributing um, to leadership positions here at the university and also um, in our society and, and other um, professional activities. So, for example, Elio was um, pointing out that Fred Neidhart was a uh, president of ASM, but he is one of five. 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 So our department has had five separate presidents of ASM. So that's just one example. Um, including Novi, the first one. Including line. Novi himself. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, journals that require editors, um, which is not a small amount of work. Um, uh, Victorita has been an editor for Journal of Bacteriology. And then Mike Imperiali is going to be the um, new um, founding editor-in-chief of a new journal called um, M Sphere. ASM's newest uh, journal. Um, we also have uh, my colleague uh, Kathy Spindler, as you know, um, is active contributor to This Week in Virology. I have the privilege of working with you on This Week in Microbiology. Um, Mary has a leadership position uh, dedicated to graduate and postgraduate training. And there are just many, many examples. So I think when you come here and become part of, the, of this department, you look um, to the colleagues who are three to five years ahead of you, and you see that the example they set, um, it's really been inspired by Fred, Fred Neidhart when I first came, uh, the great teaching and, and leadership positions he held, and then it's, it's carried on. Um, and I think that's such an important part because we know that um, our field requires not only excellent scientists, but there's all kinds of other work that needs to be done. And I'm really proud of my colleagues here that step up to do those. Uh, I'd like to point out that this event, uh, the dedication of the plaque commemorating the milestone site, is not the only event. After we're done, and we will have to run and grab a bite for lunch if we can, <laughs> it may be difficult, there is a symposium honoring uh, Fred Neidhardt and Ralph Freder. And I should, I'd like to say something about it. Uh, honoring Fred Neidhardt is very obvious because a lot of people know about him. And this, he's already been mentioned a few times. But Ralph Rader was a unique individual who started really, he was one of the fathers of, of uh, the microbiome studies. And he did things which were rather remarkable. One of the pieces of microbiological, microbiological chutzpah that I like to point out is he ran a chemostat, a continuous culture device, inoculating it with human feces. Now that takes a nerve. <laughs> and uh, a nerve of steel, I should say, and, and a special olfactory system as well. He, uh, he found out really amazing things in, the, in a way that system doesn't exactly mirror, but it does duplicate a condition that is found in the human intestine. So he had really visionary, a visionary attitude towards it. I'm glad that uh, he's being honored, but this is a joint symposium in honor of Neidhart and Frieder. Any time for lunch? <laughs> you, you'll get lunch, no problem. Lunch is provided. <clears throat> I think it's really cool that we have two of my podcast hosts right here. And just to go back to this theme of just doing the right thing and not having quotas, right? I, I didn't pick you because you were both at UM or you were both women. I ran into you and I thought you would make great hosts, right? So, so far, do, so good? Yeah, so far, so good. <laughs> you, you guys are great. I, I love it. I think, well, it's unprecedented. We have two at one place. Maybe we could have three at some point, right? I'm always open to new podcasts. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some science that you guys do. I read a lot of your papers uh, on the plane here. All of you, I read it, three of each of your papers. But I'm going to let you tell us what you want to talk about, because I'm, I'm always happy to uh, uh, follow along. And let's start with you, Mary. Um, tell us, uh, Michelle said last night, have them give their elevator talk, but that's too, that's too <laughs> short. <laughs> tell us what has been your main research passion here. You know, um, I'll actually say instead something that we've been working on and really excited about over the last few years in my lab. And, and I want to acknowledge that this has been collaborative work with the students and postdocs in my lab who have really tremendously opened new doors and fields for me. And that is to understand how really fundamental cellular stress responses in eukaryotic cells uh, impact 
innate immune signaling in response to infection. So for example, we're all familiar with the major secretory apparatus of cells, the endoplasmic reticulum in mammalian cells and eukaryotic cells. And there's been a huge amount of just foundational work done um, by a number of people like Peter Walter and David Ron studying how cells respond to stress of that system. And it turns out that those really important stress sensors are actually tied into the innate immune circuits of the cell, but in a really special way so that when cells like macrophages, which are a first line of defense, are infected by pathogens, bacteria, viruses, other things, um, these stress sensors tend to get activated but only partially, so it's very different than other types of stress. And we don't really understand exactly why that happens. So people in my lab have been focusing in, uh, in recent years on understanding what the consequences of activating these cellular stress pathways are. And some of them are um, really ramping up inflammation. Some of them include um, triggering and enabling uh, various antimicrobial mechanisms such as turning on reactive oxygen species produ production. And then um, others um, may include trying to produce particular danger signals like uh, that indicate mitochondrial damage. And so it's just been tremendous fun to get into this new area and this new intersection of mammalian and bacterial biology um, that I think continues to teach us new things. So what kind of stress do you uh, put on cells to study this? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me what kind of stress do I put on myself, and I was thinking, oh, writing grants, that, that, that helps to enhance my immunity. Um, but so, for example, just adding um, bacterial ligands, so you can do this in part um, by just putting heat-killed bacteria on cells, and again, for reasons we don't understand, they mm -hmm. respond to that as if they are experiencing a stress to the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's a little bit different if you infect with live bacteria. And of course, since many of us are interested in pathogenesis, it turns out if you use different kinds of bacteria, like Legionella or Listeria monocytogenes or Brucella abortus or MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, they all stimulate different patterns of ER stress that then have different downstream consequences in the inflammatory output of the macrophage. Hmm. So I always view stress responses as a way of giving the cell some time to fix things, right? So if there's misfolding in the ER, you stop protein synthesis so that you can take care of that, but apparently it's way beyond that. Hugely right? beyond that, and that's something that's been fun to discover every day because there are things in the cell that I just completely take for granted. And it turns out that these things are very highly regulated during infection, like upregulation of chaperone proteins to help aid in protein folding in cell survival in response to oxidative stress. So as they're trying to kill the bacteria, it's better if they don't kill themselves as well. And so all of these stress systems really, I think, are weapons to help the mammalian cell um, get the upper hand in the fight with the bacterial infection. So I read about one of yours uh, that you work on, IRE1-alpha, which seemed really interesting. Can you give us the low down there? Yeah, so really briefly, um, one of the things that we and others have identified are a link between one of these ER stress sensors, IRE1-alpha, and a molecular machine called the inflammasome, which is important for processing a really potent inflammatory cytokine called IL-1-beta. This is important during infections. It's important in many auto-inflammatory diseases. And it turns out that it actually um, is associated with chronic stress diseases as well, stress like diabetes, you know, things like that. So it probably has broader relevance than just infection. And it turns out that at least in the infection models that we used, um, which include, again, a, a vaccine strain of Brucella abortus, which turned out to be incredibly useful in ways I couldn't possibly have predicted, um, that IRE1 activates the inflammasome not in a sort of direct signaling pathway, but actually by triggering in a very regulated way damage in the mitochondria. So what this sensor does is it triggers a mechanism that causes mitochondria to increase their reactive oxygen species production, and that's a danger signal that then triggers a machine that just pokes holes in the mitochondria to let out mitochondrial constituents into the cytosol. And that's something that generally only happens when wow. cells are in danger. Yeah, isn't that cool? Wow. That was um, the work of Denise Bronner, who's just been a tremendous student in the lab, and, and um, has, she's really gone on to expand that work in a lot of interesting ways. So how, ER, IRE1 alpha is an ER resident? Correct, it's an ER resident. And what is, it, what is it sensing? So um, a, 
much work by, by many different labs have suggested that the ER luminal portion of IRE1 is able to sense unfolded proteins. There's a little bit of controversy as to whether it actually senses misfolded proteins or senses loss of chaperone binding of the chaperone called BIP. Um, but when that is activated, um, it triggers activation of the cytosolic business end of this protein, which has two functions. One is a kinase, and one is an endonuclease. And that triggers the then the signaling cascade that leads to this mitochondrial and damage. If I'm right, the endonuclease clips a message, it splices it in a way that yep. makes a product that then has exactly. the downs. That's amazing. It is. It's just, a, and like I said, a lot of this, and this is a great plug for basic biology, which we heard about a lot this morning, that this was all beautifully worked out in Peter Walter's lab in yeast. Um, and and it's, so it's conserved from yeast to mammals, and that beautiful regulatory mechanism um, was really defined using that system. And then the downstream effect of that is to poke holes in the mitochondria. Yep. And what's what does that do? So that lets out mitochondrial DNA. And generally, during normal cellular function, mitochondrial DNA doesn't have any business being in the cytoplasm. So that is a danger signal, much in the way, for example, that viral nucleic acids tend to set off these danger signals. And so it's one mechanism by which the cell can produce um, these so-called damps or danger-associated molecular patterns that trigger activation of molecular machines like the inflammasome. So that DNA is going to be sensed by the cytoplasmic Correct. sensor like sea gas and sting and all that? That's the idea. And in this yeah. case, we don't know which one it is. We have some guesses, but we're, that's definitely a, an interesting question we're trying, we're trying to resolve. I want to ask you a very far out question. <laughs> is it totally out of the question that the lysis of the mitochondria is induced by a virus? Hmm. Is it out of the question? No, actually, I never say anything's out of the question. I would say I have no evidence for it. Um, but I have to say that uh, there have been a lot of surprises as we've gone on in this project. And so, um, so now that you've alerted me to that, maybe we'll try and figure out if we can see how that works. It'd be, it'd be miraculous, but... <laughs> is, there any, is there any reason you ask that? Do you have some evidence for we're just thinking? I like viruses. <laughs> <laughs> so do I, so do I. <laughs> so, Mary, the, the, the sensing of this mitochondrial DNA, then the result is interferon response, and you think that is in order to deal with whatever has come into the cell? In, in this case, brucella, for example, which is one of the triggers you use, right? Right. So in this case, we haven't been studying the interferon response. We're studying the inflammasome, inflammasome activation. Okay. Um, in this particular case, because we're using gram-negative bacteria, um, which, as this audience knows well, has LPS, that actually itself triggers the type 1 interferon response. So we haven't looked at that particularly, but, um, but certainly one of the things that actually has been kind of controversial in the field, which has been fun to think about, is that um, previous studies have been a little bit unclear as to whether or not mitochondrial damage was important for activation of this particular inflammasome machinery. Um, and so um, one, one of our colleagues here, not in our department, unfortunately, but a collaborator uh, of many of us, uh, Gabriel Nunez, who's been just a tremendous leader in the field of innate immunity, um, had identified conditions that were very important for activating this inflammasome that didn't require mitochondrial damage. And so we thought very hard and carefully when our data seemed to indicate that it was required. And so I think one contribution from this recent study is that there clearly have to be at least two different mechanisms. So the field, I think, was trying very hard in the way that scientists do to come down to some kind of unified field theory. Um, but probably in this case, as for many things, it's more complex um, than really a simple linear pathway. So you work on intracellular pathogens. Yes. Do you collaborate with Michelle at certainly, all? You certainly. Play, you we play do. golf with her? Uh, you know what? I'm not gifted in that way. No. <laughs> so now I, I see that to Michelle. Are you on the same floor or far away? No. no well, we're not. The whole department is housed within, uh, most of us, two floors. Okay. And then. So you're also a dean of graduate and undergraduate education. So what do you do in that job? Well, I want to say, first of all, that I'm following in some very large footsteps of, of our colleague, Victorita, who was uh -huh. uh, in this position before me. So really what we do here is try to think about how we educate um, trainees in the business of science. And actually, um, it'll be a surprise to none of you that really we largely still use the apprenticeship model um, that has um, was sort of pioneered uh, by others before us that we talked about, like Frederick Novi. And in fact, my trainees are probably laughing, not because I write in their notebooks, you know, those kinds of things, but because I look over their shoulder and, and mutter those kinds of things. Um, but, <laughs> but actually, one of the major 
uh, things that uh, we've been trying to think about is how we can bring our training paradigm forward into into the 21st century. And that is to recognize that um, the biomedical sciences have such a huge and profound effect on our society. Um, and this includes, of course, medicine, agriculture, um, health, the microbiome. I mean, really in every way you can possibly imagine. And so we want to try to think about how we can incorporate in our curriculum, so not just as extracurricular activities, but how we can really think about skills that are important for our students and postdocs to be really successful and competitive and do you know, great things um, outside the lab as well as in the lab. And so that sounds simple, um, but sometimes really changing that paradigm, which has been so successful and, and exciting and fun for all of us, um, you know, can be challenging. But I think uh, having a department like this, I think with a great tradition of training, has been a, a good place to start and a good laboratory um, to work with our junior colleagues to think about ways we can do better. Thank you. Harry, let's, let's talk with you a bit. I want to talk about your science. But I have a question for you first. What is the most important thing you can do as chair of this department? That's a great question, Vince. I'm not sure. <laughs> no. what, what, we, what we want to do in our department is to uh, gather the community of scholars and give them the tools to do, to do their work. So. Uh, since I've been here, we've been able to double the department from 14 to 27. If you include Mark Schlissel, that's 28 faculty. <laughs> and so uh, we've had uh, two retirements, and then we've had our colleague Victorita go on to leadership role at, at Michigan State. But uh, other than that, we haven't had anybody leave. So uh, keeping the troops uh, as happy as possible, motivated, uh, and give them the tools to do uh, their work and let them do their work. I think that's the most important thing. All right. Now tell us what really excites you in your lab? Well, one thing that's excited me is that someone that you actually read my paper. So I think you might be the, the first person ever to have read my paper. So that's, uh, that's extremely uh, exciting. I appreciate that. So uh, I was a trained uh, cell wall physiologist and, and uh, uh, ion transport uh, expert, I suppose, uh, and then learned bacterial genetics at the Center for Vaccine Development. And at that time, I opened my lab and I could not wait to open my own lab. I had startup funds of about, uh, you know, not very much. And in fact, I had some interesting situations where I, uh, I rolled an ultra centrifuge down Baltimore Street that I'd bought for $600 and I uh, rolled it up into my laboratory. I dragged a French pressure cell from a basement uh, up into my, I used glassware that was given away by retiring, uh, uh, retiring faculty and 100-year-old uh, reagent bottles and so on. And so this was very exciting. But when I did open my lab, I was very, became very enamored of uh, bacterial pathogenesis. And at that time, it was an ex extremely exciting field, still is. But the tools had just become available for cloning and mutation and uh, this type of thing. And so this was uh, incredibly fascinating. I had a, a mentor at the University of Maryland, uh, John Warren, who was interested in, from an epidemiologic standpoint in, in uh, urinary tract infection. Uh, but had not done any laboratory investigation. And this was a uh, pretty wide open field. So we became interested in uh, what we call complicated urinary tract infection. That is individuals with catheters or structural abnormalities or spinal cord injury that would get infections with multi multiple species. So we worked with, worked with bacteria that we collected from uh, a year long study from, from nursing home, from catheterized patients, worked with Proteus mirabilis and bacterial urease and this kind of thing. And then it became evident that, uh, that we should turn our attention to the cause of uncomplicated infection, the bacteria that infect the otherwise healthy, mostly women, uh, and that was E. coli. So uh, uh, it turns out this bacteria has 500 extra genes beyond the commensal E. coli. And so what the heck do those 500 extra genes do? And of course, we didn't know that for decades, actually, after I'd started that, that they had these, uh, these traits. How so did we you find out that there were 500 by genome sequencing? Yes, genome sequencing revealed that if you do comparative genomic analysis you have in, in the order of, of that many extra genes. Adhesins, iron acquisition systems, toxins, uh, various metabolic genes that are, are in addition that make, make the bacteria at home in the urinary tract and not just the gut. So let me understand this. So in your gut we have commensal E. coli and in individuals who get urinary tract infections, do their, their gut E. coli have 500 extra genes? Yeah, so they're colonized in addition to, in addition okay. to commensal E. coli with your pathogenic uh, e. coli, and those do apparently no harm to the individual until they colonize the periurethral area and infect the bladder. Are most of us colonized with these 
E. coli with 500 extra? I don't think so. No? No. But it might be a reason for a recurrent, recurrent infection. So one interesting thing going, uh, you know, through the decades here was the uh, advancement in technology. You know, we suffered through trying to make a single mutant and comparing it its virulence in a mouse model or whatever, uh, and so on. And then various other techniques came along, you know, signature tag mutagenesis and vivo antigen uh, technology, IVETs and all those things. Now we have, uh, you know, half throughput sequencing that's allowed us to do the TNC technology. And so, you know, what we what took us years to do us in a single gene, you know, we can now do for the entire genome. And, and well, I would say uh, we could do it in a month, but, you know, let's say a year, you know, as it, as it turns out. Uh, and so we have been interested in uh, how genes are expressed, what genes are expressed during actual infection. For years, we examined gene expression in a test tube, you know, and uh, various what we thought were virulence factors. Then we asked the question, what's actually expressed during human infection, so or 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 mammalian infection. So first we collect urine from mouse, you know, one drop at a time, times 25 mice, times 10 days, make a graduate student crazy, and then uh, uh, do a uh, you know microarray analysis of genes that are expressed. Then we move to human infection, going to the both the urology clinic and actually our university clinic, and staking it out, waiting for people to come to uh, uh, with complaints of urinary tract infection, we'd exchange a $10 Starbucks card for uh, a cup of urine. Seemed like a fair trade. And <laughs> uh, stabilize this immediately and uh, do RNA-seq analysis on, on these. So now we, we have a good idea of exactly what genes are expressed in the, in, in the host, you know, quote, during infection, immediately out of the, uh, out of the bladder, uh, as compared to, say, in vivo expression, or even just in uh, ex vivo expression in filter sterilized urine, there's a big difference between expression right in the in the human host versus just culturing in urine. So, that's been the recent focus. And before I get into any more science, you know, fully realize that the people that are doing the work are the laboratory folks, the uh, the, the technicians, undergraduates, uh, graduate students, postdocs, research faculty. And I just now converted to mm. research administration and and bugging them over their shoulder. So this work's been uh, uh, done by these people. Sure. They're fantastic. Yeah. Can fantastic I ask you, work. If you, can you compare the gene expression of E. coli in urine versus E. coli on the wall of the bladder? So no, they, the, the, the students would not allow us to take their bladders. <laughs> so number one, so. Nor with the IRB. Even though we had an IRB. And so your, your, your point is well taken. So what you, you could say that we're collecting the urine, these might be the losers. Uh, you know, ones that are not adhering to the kidney wall or, or, or bladder wall. Uh, but in, in addition to just urine coming out into the cup, there's a lot of exfoliated uh, uropithelial cells. And so we're, uh, we're, we are getting a sampling of those that are adherent to that. Indeed, if you look overall at the expression of adherence genes in the urine, they are a little bit low, you know, because probably they are sticking to the side of the bladder. Is there any one gene or set of genes that you find on in every person with a... Infection. Well, it was a surprise, yeah. So the, what, what's, expressed, what's expressed in vivo in, 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 during an infection that's not expressed in, in urine, uh, human urine? Mm. And the answer was ion transport systems. So these bugs are transporting copper, nickel, sulfate at an extremely high rate. Some export, some import. Uh, and also degradation of ethanolamine, uh, so which would be a component of epithelial cell membranes. They're doing this like crazy. So uh, these were not what we thought were classic virulence factors. We're used to toxins and an iron acquisition and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. these types of things. And, and then here's some metabolic genes that have just gone haywire, and the, uh, the bacteria, I guess, know what they're doing. But uh, this was a, it was a big, I think, breakthrough. So we're following uh, up on some of those systems now. And these, do you, do you know or do you suspect that these give them an advantage in the, in the bladder? So if we, uh, we, we, we learned of these by, you know, RNA-seq and also, uh, you know, TNC, and so that's in a collection of millions of mutants. So in each case, we had to take those genes that we identified, make a, make a specific clean mutant and compare it to wild type strain. And in most of those cases, you see it's also attenuated when you compare it head to head with wild type strain. So yes. Uh, ethanol utilization is a recurrent theme now. Salmonella does that in the gut. So you think this is a general phenomenon? So, you know, the bacteria have to eat and, uh, and they, they don't eat sugars, they eat amino acids, and I think the ethanolamine's a great, probably carbon and nitrogen source that it could uh, devour. And so those genes are really revved up during, during infection. So these are part of the 500 extra genes that are in these E. coli, which they didn't acquire so they could grow in the bladder. They got them somewhere else. Some of them are. So 
where, where, did the, where did these come from? Do you acquire a strain already with these genes, and then one day perhaps you get a UTI? Is that how it works? Well, when you you know you look at the look at the gene content, these these things are riddled with pathogenicity islands. There'll be uh, segments of DNA between thirty and hundred base pairs that are, that are are flanked by phage and transposons, mm. and uh, so they've acquired by horizontal gene transfer over the over the millennia. I don't think that they're probably, uh, you know, made to order in the gut right before you get an infection. I think they've been been hanging around. So there's lots of evidence for this uh, genetic exchange in these bacteria, remnants of transposons and so on. And you acquire these how? In your diet or? Well, yeah, there's, you know, there've been studies where, uh, you know, they've, they've uh, cultured, uh, cultured chickens uh, uh, in, in an area where there's only one hospital and uh, five grocery stores. This was out in the Southwest. and. Uh, and they found that uh, the same strains that are on your chicken, beef, et cetera, showed up in the clinical laboratory. So you might have a foodborne UTI. Obviously, other fecal oral okay. contamination uh, can spread this, these bugs. So do you think that if, a, say, a child is born into a family where the parents have these E. coli with the extra genes, they'll get colonized as well? And maybe I think there, there's evidence for the, the same bugs yeah. being in the, hmm. in, the, in the family, mother and okay. child. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I interrupted your train of thought. No, I think the train stopped at the station. So is he... <laughs> it's okay. Does he have a good sense of humor? Yes, yeah. he does. I'm getting the sense, yeah. I don't know you very well, but I'm glad to see that. So Doesn't a chair have to have a good sense of humor? I know plenty of chairs with that. We definitely me. have to have a sense of humor to be the chair. That's, that's, question, <laughs> that's right? good. That's good. I read in one of your papers efforts to make a vaccine. Yeah, very exciting. So... Uh, when, when we came to Michigan, and that was a kind of a scary proposition, not only to take the chair, but to actually, you know, get the lab back up and running. So fortunately, four people came with us, and we decided at that point to do some translational work. You know, I guess if I'd heard bench to bedside one more time, I was going to kill myself. But we decided to we decided to get into some translational work. And by looking at gene expression uh, in the host, in mice, uh, looking at uh, the genes that are present in your pathogenic strains that are not in commensal strains, uh, seeing what proteins are immunogenic, what are, what can be shaved off the surface by uh, by proteases, uh, we finally boiled down 5,000 genes down to 10 that were expressed. All of them were iron acquisition proteins that were either receptors for siderophores or receptors for heme binding, uh, and there were dreadful proteins to work with because they're beta barrel proteins in the outer membrane and they crash out of solution. And uh, but nevertheless, we. Uh, my, advisor, my PhD advisor, said that I could purify anything to heterogeneity. And so uh, <laughs> uh, we had done that. We actually enriched very heavily for these proteins uh, and intranasally vaccinated mice with 10 of them. One antigen killed all the mice immediately. Uh, five of them did not do anything, no protection. And four of them rendered protection after vaccination, two boosts, and then a subsequent challenge with 10 of the eighth bacteria in the bladder either protecting the bladder or the kidney or both. And so now that's exactly where we are right now. So we need to apply human adjuvants, uh, combinations of antigens, various routes, rather intranasal may not be the best way to go and uh, to move forward on that. So hopefully in the next five years, we'll take that to a point where it could be have human trials involved. So is there a need for this? Yes, there's a need for, for individuals that have recurrent urinary tract infections. So half of all women get one infection, but you know, maybe maybe 10% go on to get uh, recurrent infection, and about 2.5% of women in the United States. So that would, by the way, that would fill up 40 big houses at once, uh, have continuous urinary tract infections. And so these, uh, it's, it, it's important to uh, not only end that kind of misery, but also the important sequela. So you can get uh, kidney infection, pyelonephritis, or you can go on to get urosepsis and so on. So we'd hope we could halt that at some point. So this vaccine has to make good mucosal immunity in the bladder, right? Yeah, the evidence is that uh, antibodies produced both in the serum and more weakly in the bladder correlate, they correlate very strongly with protection in the murine model. Okay. And this would not have a negative effect on the commensals in the gut. So the, the antigens that we picked are produced primarily by uropathogenic E. coli. Great. And I guess we shouldn't kill the E. coli and the, you know, the commensal E. coli, but I'm not sure we know. But I, I, for me, I'm not going to try to okay. do Okay, got it. You can do an explorer program. What's that? I was just saying that we have something called the Microbiome Explorer Program. I'd mentioned the uh, host microbiome initiative that we had started here. 
And one of the things that we're trying to do is get people who had never thought of applying not even just microbiome research, but microbiology research in any way. If someone's studying diabetes, someone's studying heart disease, you know, we have it so that if you have an idea, if you have ongoing research, we can actually try to look at communities of microbes or sure. using advanced techniques like Harry was talking about to study the potential role of microbes in any sort of disease. Okay. Michelle, did you want to ask Harry a question? No. No, no you're doing great. No, you could ask him for a raise, for example. <laughs> right in front of the audience. Sorry, about, sorry, my microphone's not working. <laughs> Very good. So is that, is that enough for you? Or? That's enough for me. You got, okay, I thank you. I think the audience has had enough. All right. <laughs> of me. Vincent, Vince, what's, uh, what's exciting you these days? So... If you were to ask the graduate students in the department what I do, they say, oh, yeah, he's that microbiome guy who studies Clostridium difficile. And <laughs> less at the danger of making it seem like all the infectious disease doctors here like the history of science and medicine, I'll go into a little bit of the history of science and medicine because it influences what we're doing now. So we are studying C. difficile, and we'd already heard a little bit about Rolf Frater, who was looking at the metabolism of communities of microbes in the gut. Another researcher here at the University of Michigan was uh, Bob Fekety, who was the founding uh, chief of infectious diseases here. And he was studying Clostridium difficile. Uh, he had the unlikely distinction of being the second person to fulfill Koch's postulates for C. difficile in the <laughs> hamster model. So everyone remembers John Bartlett. Not as many remember Bob Fekety. But they were working at the same time on looking at how the communities of microbes that live within the intestines of a mammal can protect that mammal from infectious diseases. They actually had a trainee that both of them wrote papers with. They, ne they never co-published a paper. I looked, looked at that to see, because they were, you know, one was on that side and one was on this side of the University of Michigan. But they both published with a, a physician scientist named Ken Wilson, who actually published both with Bob Fekety and with Rolf Frater separately, looking at this idea of what is microbiome research? And it was being done in the early and mid 80s by Ken, sort of ahead of the time of being able to really understand what was going on at the level at which we understand the microbiome now. But it was that, you know, I was in medical school at that time, and that's when I first heard about C. difficile and started thinking about this idea that communities of microbes could be something that we have to worry about. But I was always told it was too difficult to study. It was never anything that we could study. And it might surprise the graduate students to know that I actually got my PhD in gram-negative pathogenesis. Uh, I had started with uh, Stanley and Gary just after Ralph Isberg had left, and he'd left behind this Invasin project. And all of a sudden, people were very interested in how bacteria could interact with mammalian hosts, could take advantage of cell surface receptors and all that. And that was my PhD thesis. But then as I went through my clinical training, I was trying to think of things that were more clinically relevant. I kind of went through a, a period of time where I was studying inflammatory bowel disease and mouse models. And from that is where I started looking at the idea of complex communities of microbes. But it was only until after I came to the University of Michigan that I really started to have a C. difficile research program. And Mary had mentioned about the trainees. You know, the trainees that I've had, I've had two graduate students uh, since I've been here, and both of them have radically changed what I do. The first was Angela Reeves. They had just published, a group in Boston had just published a mouse model of C. difficile. Up until that time, most people used the hamster model, and you didn't have all the reagents, such as knockout mice and great immunologic reagents, to study it. And there was this publication in gastroenterology just after I got here where they used five antibiotics for a certain period of time in the drinking water, wait two days, give another antibiotic intraperitoneally, and then all of a sudden you can infect the mice with C. difficile. And Angela Reeves was a rotating grad student, and I said, let's see if we can recreate this. If you can re recreate this, you have a great thesis project. It takes advantage of what we've started doing in microbial communities and looking to see how the gut microbial community was changed by antibiotics. She was able to make it work during her rotation. She stayed, she got her PhD, and 
Our first paper in C. difficile from my lab was published in 2008. You know, people assume that I've been studying C. difficile since you know, I could learn to read and write. But it's something a little bit more recent in my group. And, uh, and that's changed things quite a bit. And that's what we're doing a lot now. We've moved, as a physician scientist, we've moved to do clinical translational research. I agree if we hear bench to bed sign anymore, you know, you kind of, you hear it a lot, but we figured at a place like this, we could actually do it. And that's the thing that was exciting about coming to Michigan. You know, the hospital's right there. You walk down the hall, um, hope the infection prevention people aren't listening, but in a hospital this size, there are a thousand cases of C. difficile a year. Wow. And uh, we actually had a project where we collected fecal samples and the bacteria from all of those patients for two and a half years. So we have almost 3,000 fresh isolates and samples and clinical metadata where we can kind of begin to look how is the intersection between the host, the host response, the microbial communities in the gut, and the pathogen. How do all of those interplay that some people get recurrent disease, some people get severe disease, where other people are successfully treated with a single round of antibiotics. So that's a lot of what we're doing, but along with Mary, we've actually started another collaboration with someone in GI, starting to look at small intestinal organoids, you know, these, uh, these little balls of pristine epithelium that are derived from people who study developmental biology. And we're trying to leverage those into new ways to look at bacterial and viral pathogens. So, and once again, it was a trainee who started this all out. My other graduate student, John C. Leslie, sort of as a side project when she came in, I, Jason Spence had arrived here, he says, hey, we have these little things called organoids. They look like small intestine. They don't have any bugs in them. Do you think they could be useful for studying pathogenesis? And I said, give it a try as a side project. And once again, a trainee has changed what we're doing in the lab, that about half the lab is devoted to studying this organoid model system now as well. So these thousands of samples that you mentioned from all the C. diff infections, what are you trying to get out of that? Do you want to see the, the, the population of the microbes, how they correlate with, with different severities or recurrences? Right, the dogma always was that when you take the antibiotics, you somehow disturb the normal microbiota, or when I was in med school, the normal flora of the gut was changed and somehow this destroyed something that we called colonization resistance, C. difficile could come in. We didn't know what the mechanisms of that was. And so we were fortunate, there are a number of people in the room, Pat Schloss, Gary Huffnagel, David Aronoff who left, we actually put together a team where we were looking at everything from host response to microbiome to pathogen genomics. And with regards to the fecal samples, Pat and his graduate students and students and postdocs from my lab have been looking to see what actually is different in a susceptible community versus one that's resistant. And we start by looking at 16S, which tells us about the structure and the dynamics. But I like to say that's really looking at the anatomy of the community. I think the next thing is to look at really the physiology of the community. They're doing that through metatranscriptomics, through metabolomics, through germ-free experiments where you try to come up with hypotheses, okay, this kind of function is important at trying to restrict C. difficile. We've looked a lot at bile acid metabolism as well as uh, carbohydrate metabolism and just beginning to begin to tease what functions does the microbiome actually have to keep us healthy. Isn't that something we've talked about on TWIM? It's not just the composition of the microbiome, the metabolic products that they make, right? <clears throat> Did you want to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm particularly interested in your work on the organoids, and I'll tell you why. Uh, one of the problems with intestinal studies of intestinal microbiome is that the easiest thing in the world to collect is a fecal sample, and the hardest thing to collect is a in situ uh, sample from the gut. And we know very little about that, and including the process which we are daily acquainted with, which I'll call turdopoiesis, <laughs> of which we know relatively little. <laughs> so, uh, turdopoiesis, that's a challenge to one of my grad students to, or postdocs to put that into a paper somewhere. <laughs> and credit, we have to do the reference. Do you actually have a reference that we can cite for that, Elio? You, you can quote me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the title of this. <laughs> Blue turbopoiesis. <laughs> So what is the, 
what do you think will be the end way to fix this problem? Right now in C. difficile, obviously all the rage, at least by the public press, is the fecal transplant and what we refer to as the next generation fecal transplants. But it's a pretty, it's a pretty crude method of doing something. We're, we're doing something that we know it works. I mean, the fact that it has about a 90% efficacy for patients with recurrent disease, a single fecal transplant, will cure them, where standard antibiotic therapy generally only works about maybe 10% to 30%, depending on the series. But I think the future is we still don't know what we're doing when we give a whole fecal transplant. If we can understand the functions that an individual microbe or a small group of microbes might be able to do, uh, the president talked about precision medicine. President Schlissel talked about precision medicine. Perhaps, you know, one of the dreams we have is when you give blood samples and everything else when you come into the hospital, maybe you do actually have to give a turd sample so that you can be figuring out what might be missing or what might be extra that you could try to get rid of and try to manipulate it. But we're a long ways away from that. I think that's the promise. And if you read what's in the press, it seems like it's just around the corner, but I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, and it's difficult work, and there are going to be a lot of dead ends, and hopefully someday we'll be able to manipulate the microbiome in ways that we can predict and understand what we're going to do. Don't forget the, the virome. I think yeah. a lot of mm. people don't think that as part of our microbiome, but and a lot of studies don't look at it. But clearly, it, not just the phages, but the eukaryotic viruses. Is that, do you ever look at that or consider that? We haven't as much. My colleague, Pat Schloss, is. Um, other, uh, you know, the paper that came out from the group at WashU in St. Louis with Skip Virgin and uh, uh, Jeff Gordon, they're looking at it as well. So it is an area that people are looking at. I think the only reason we focused on the bacteria is, was mostly technology. The fact that sure. when Mitch Sogan came up with the idea of let's come up with PCR and then high throughput sequencing, you can do that if you use the 16S yeah. gene as a target. It's kind of hard to come up with these kind of broad range or near universal targets for RNA viruses and or even the bacteriophage for that matter. So I think that there are a lot of people who are looking at it now, now that we've gotten past the bacteria and kind of know how to do that. We have to tackle the next technical hurdle. Harry, you wanted to say something? No? I said it no. Uh, I have another hobby horse about the intestinal microbiome. It seems to me that uh, proteins are totally forgotten. <laughs> and there are amoebas in the gut, and they eat bacteria. And why don't they eat more? In fact, a, a difficult thing to explain about vertebrate, the vertebrate gut, is that it's, the intestine is not loaded with proteins, which it is in termites. Right. In the termites, they are, they're really critical for harboring the communities that help the termites digest the wood. Um, and the only reason I know that is because I was at Michigan State and Tom Schmidt studied termite gut and told me about that. But he, he brought up the same idea that we don't think about the protists. But perhaps the bacteria in mammalian guts have evolved to kind of defend themselves from the protists. And for ex and you know, only you know, we bring up Legionella. You know, we always talk about why does what is coiling phagocytosis all for? And there's all this thought about well, maybe it can be not interactions with macrophages, but with protists like amoeba. Perhaps other bacteria have ways that they can kind of keep those protists in check. But again, that's all. It's all the guess. It's kind of fun. Can I ask you a question, Elia? Sure. So you brought up the idea of mitochondria. Were you suggesting since mitochondria are endosymbionts that perhaps something like a bacteriophage for this endosymbiont could well, attack we don't, them? Well, we don't see any prophage genomes in the mitochondrial genome, but who knows? And it's a real question whether, why, why aren't there chloroplast phages and mitochondrial phages for attacking from the outside? Is that yeah. a Talmudic question? That's a Talmudic question, yeah. We asked those questions in our blog, so this is, I think it's one with, that came up in the blog. So. With the small T, right? All right, I've been told by my producer that we have to wrap this up. So we will conclude this episode of TWIM, which you can find on iTunes. 
You can also find it at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. And if you have a cell phone, whether it be an iOS or an Android device, there are apps that you can use to get the podcast downloaded for free. It's all free, and uh, it'll be there as long as the computers keep running, I suppose. And if you have questions or comments, you can send them to twim at twiv.tv. I want to thank everyone here today for joining us from the University of Michigan, Harry Mobley. Thank you so much. Tell so you're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for having us. <laughs> also from the University of Michigan, Vince Young. Thank you, Vince. Thanks for giving me a chance to bookend with another Vince. Well, you know, we can have you back sometime and you can uh, talk even more, right? Michelle can teach you how to Skype. All right. <laughs> and Mary O'Reardon is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Mary. It's been fun. Yeah, you're welcome. And my two co-hosts who are here at TWIM regularly, Michelle Swanson from the University of Michigan. Thank yes, you, Michelle. Thank you, but I, I really want to thank both you and Elio for making the trip. Um, it really has added a lot to our Milestones uh, program. Thank you very pleasure. much. As I said, thank you for the invitation. And Elio Schechter, you can find him at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. Well, it was such a pleasure being here. I'm really delighted. Now you can have some lunch, you know. Wow. <laughs> I'm Vincent Draconiello. You can find me at virology.ws. I would like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, and in particular, Chris Kandine and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. <laughs>